Dear ELCA, you've been tricked. I'm sorry, I don't know a nicer way to say it. I've been watching your assembly videos, almost all of them now, reading the resolutions and the social statements, and I can see in them that you mean well, that you're driven by a concern and compassion for your neighbor, which is good, but that, in fact, is part of the trick. Now, I know I'm an outsider. I left well, almost uh, 20 years, more than 20 years ago, and I admit that I haven't been paying much attention to your conversation until a few weeks ago, but I've been listening carefully since then, and I hope that you will welcome a couple of observations from an outsider. First, you've been tricked into thinking that uncertainty is humility. It's not. It is not arrogant to be sure of the things that God has told us. There was a bit of hubbub in your convention regarding lines 639 to 641 of a declaration of inner religious intent. The declaration states, Hence we must be careful about claiming to know God's judgment regarding another religion or the individual human being who practices it. God, on the other hand, says, You shall have no other gods. And God, when he gave Moses the first commandment, when he gave Moses the Ten Commandments, was talking about other religions. God, it turns out, has a very poor opinion of anything claiming to be God, and he calls people worshiping false gods idolaters. Now, the first commandment might be uncomfortable, but it is certainly not unclear. And to pretend that we don't know what God thinks about the worship of other gods is not humility, it is in fact a breathtaking hubris. Theological uncertainty, it seems to me, is almost a starting point for your conversations. You seem to be more interested in what you can't know about God than what you can know about God. You can't put God in a box. That was almost the conversation stopper. It was like the theological assertion that ended all theological debate. And I suppose, for what it's worth, it's true. If God doesn't want to be in a box, woe to the person trying to stuff him in. But it must be equally true that if God wants to be in a box, woe to the person trying to pry him out of the box. But this, it seems to me, was the entire agenda of your assembly. God has placed himself in boxes for us. And first, in the, in the body of Jesus. And in the manger and in the tomb and in the prophetic and apostolic word. God has put himself in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit has given us assertions so that we know the mind of God. The Bible, then, is God in a box or God in a book, and it's no good trying to pry him out, and it's, and it's not safe to try. But with the pry bar of higher criticism wedged against the fulcrum of uncertainty and with all the might of culture, you were trying to achieve this humility of uncertainty. Now, I'll admit it's true enough that there are things about God that we cannot know. In fact, most of the truths about God we cannot attain with our own resources, which is why God has spoken to us. Through the prophets and the apostles, and through Jesus himself, God has spoken. And to act as if God has not spoken, as if he has not spoken to us about the worship of other gods, or about marriage and men and women, or whatever else, to act as if God has not spoken is wrong and it's dangerous. Remember that old Hindu proverb that says there was three blind men in a room with an elephant, and one man felt his tail and said, it's a vine, and the other man felt his leg and said, it's a tree trunk, and the other man felt his ear and says, it's a fan or a banana leaf or something like that. It's all fine, I suppose, that the blind men would have to have an, a humility about their own assertions in, in light of the validity of the other men's observations. That is, until the elephant opens his mouth and says, I'm an elephant. And then humility looks much different. Humility then is saying, this is an elephant. In the scriptures, humility and faith and certainty all go together. They're not separated from one another. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1. 1. It is a trick to think that uncertainty is humility. 
you've also been tricked into setting love against the commandments. At some point in your theological conversation, a line was drawn and compassion stood on one side and the commandments on the other. Charity was on one side and the law on the other. Love was on one side and truth was set in opposition to it on the other. And you have in this way confused God's mercy for his permission. You've made Jesus the champion of tolerance instead of the savior of sinners. Let me give you an example. The law of God says that a man not, ought not to act like he is married to another man. That's simple enough. But at some point in the last generation, it was determined that this sentiment is unloving. In order to be compassionate to the L and the G, we have to throw out the commandments regarding marriage and sexuality, particularly the commandments that address the L and the G. The scriptures, another example, say that we are created male and female, which is simple enough, but sometime in the last five minutes of our cultural conversation, it was determined that this binary is oppressive. So in order to be compassionate to the T and the Q and the plus, I think also, we have to throw out the clarity of God regarding male and female. And here's the trick. This is where the wool gets pulled over our eyes so easily. You've been tricked into thinking that these are the only two options. It's either love without the law or the law without the love. Now, I suppose that if love and the law were opposed to each other, we would all want to be found on the side of love. But these two are not to be separated from one another. God's law is not hate speech. God's truth concerning male and female and his commandments concerning marriage as a man and a woman are not oppressive and they are not stifling. They are life-giving in the most fundamental sense. The law of God is given to us because the Lord loves us and because he desires the best for us, both in showing our sin and in showing us how to live. The law of God is a gift that comes from God's love. Therefore, love, says St. Paul, is the fulfilling of the law, and the law gives shape to our love. To weaponize love against the commandments of God is to lose them both, and I'm afraid that you have been tricked into doing precisely this. Now, if you're still here and you're still tracking with me, I want to ask two things of you, maybe offer two challenges. First, I'd like you to consider reading Martin Luther's large catechism. I don't know of anything better that addresses these things, and it's Lutheran. And every other question that divides the church, he takes up in there. Now, you can download it for free, but look, if you want a copy of this thing, I'll send you one. If you go to wolfmuller.co slash dear ELCA and you fill out the form there, I'll send you a copy of Martin Luther's large catechism for absolutely free, my gift to you and to your family. And second, I want to challenge you to call up your local LCMS pastor. I'll put a link in the description to find the closest one. Consider this an ecumenical dialogue. And if you're near Austin, Texas, give me a call. Invite the guy out for coffee at McDonald's or whatever free trade coffee place you like to go to. And if he's confused about the invitation, send him this video and tell him that I sent you. Ask this guy about the distinction between law and gospel. Ask him about the scriptures. Ask him about the love of God, about the death of Jesus, about the forgiveness of sins, and ask him any other theological questions that you've been wrestling with. Now, I'm convinced that certainty and humility go together, and I'm convinced that love and the law go together, and I'm also convinced that the best way that you can see this in reality is talk to a Lutheran pastor about life and about theology. And I hope you'll let me know how it goes. I'm praying for all of you. God's peace be with you.